The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. These are the words that Jesus said was fulfilled in Him. Uh, later on in Jesus' ministry, he said to his disciples, to those who believed in him, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And Paul wrote in Galatians 5 verse 1, he says, it was for freedom that Christ sets us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is that captives are set free. <clears throat> Pardon me. Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ frees us from sin. It frees us from the power and the penalty of sin. It frees us from death. Christ conquered death. It frees us from the law. Uh, we are free from works of the law, of, of the law as a means to be acceptable to God. Uh, the gospel frees us from the tyranny of trying to save ourselves, and it frees us so that we may live for God. But sadly, Christians who have been delivered and have been released, who have had the, the shackles of their sin and shame removed by Jesus, uh, they who have this terrible burden, this unbearable yoke of works righteousness has been removed upon believing the message of Jesus. Sadly, often we turn around and yoke ourselves again. We shackle ourselves again. We enslave ourselves again by adding requirements, uh, demands, and conditions to the gospel. And it is, it is sometimes very subtle but it is common in the church. And it steals our peace, our joy, and the freedom to live for God. You see, the gospel message teaches us that you and I are more wicked, more evil, with hearts more deceitful than we can ever imagine. Uh, every Part of our being is tainted, is marred, is warped by sin. But, but, in Christ, the two most powerful words I know, in Christ, the two most comforting words I know, in Christ, the two richest word. In, I know, in Christ, we are more loved, we are more accepted, we are more cherished and, and precious than we can ever hope or dare to dream. That is good news. That is the gospel. That is the gospel that sets us free to live for Christ. And only the true gospel, only the pure gospel, only the unadulterated uncontaminated, undistorted gospel of Jesus Christ will set us free to live for Christ. And that's why Paul reserved his really strongest condemnation, his harshest words to those who sought to distort the gospel. He said that if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be Accursed. He is to be condemned, eternally damned. The gospel is mission critical. Without the gospel, we will still be enslaved to sin. We will still be enslaved to law. We will still be enslaved to death. And so please take your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, I'll, I'll read two passages this morning, but focus on only one. Galatians chapter 1, verse, verse 6 to 10, and then also Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 21. So first, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. 
I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only that there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a, the gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And as we have said before, so I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I'm still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And then if you can just flip over to chapter 2, verse 11. This is Paul confronting or opposing Peter. He writes, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined in uh, with him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? But we Jews by nature are not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. And so this morning, from our study of the God's Word, I believe the Lord wants us to to examine, to examine ourselves, if perhaps we have exchanged the gospel of Jesus Christ for a different gospel, that we may have begun to believe and live and teach a distorted gospel, a false gospel, a gospel that is not really another gospel. But it is a jail sentence. It is a death sentence. So let us, before we do it, ask the Lord to help us. Uh, Father, we come to you, Lord, uh, in grace, in Christ, dependent on your grace, dependent on your mercy, dependent on your spirit, Lord, to, to help us, to open our eyes, Lord, to the blind spots in our own life. Lord, that we may see the truth, Lord. Lord, help us and through this message, Lord, that we would hear and examine ourselves according to what we hear. And Lord, when that correlates to what you say to us, that we would heed that. And when he doesn't, Lord, that we would leave that behind. And so bless us this morning uh, through the hearing of your word. Thank you for your spirit that implants the word of life into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
And so really, uh, uh, I want to unpack to us, first of all, just the problem that they faced in Galatia, in the, in the church in Galatia. Then really the poison of, of legalism. And then we'll look at the posturing of Peter and ours before we turn to the privilege of Paul and ours. And so first of all, just the problem that they faced in the Galatian churches. You see, this letter was written uh, really to believers, to, to, to Christian believers, to, to Gentile believers, um, who have somehow turned to enslave themselves. And it was written to, to bring correction, uh, to bring rebuke to those who have brought this distorted gospel and to bring corrections to those who have been deceived by this distorted gospel. And those who brought this gospel really is, is, is usually uh, termed or, or named the Judaizers. They were basically Jew, Jewish Christians. Uh, we see in the text that they were certain men from James in chapter 2 verse 12, that they were men from the party of the circumcision, which really means they were converts from the circumcision. Another way of saying they were Jew, Jewish Christians in chapter 2 verse 12. These were men of high reputation in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, chapter 2, verse 6. Paul called them false brethren in chapter 2, verse 4. Supplanters seeking to make the Galatians dependent on them, chapter 4, verse 17. He called them troublers and mutilators in chapter 5, verse 12. And he called them boasters in the flesh, chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. For they insisted on circumcisions. Uh, so these Jewish Christians were in essence saying that Gentile Christians must become Jewish. Uh, in order to be accepted by God, in order to be included into the people of God, in order to be justified, in order to be clean, they needed Jesus plus Judaism. Jesus plus their ancestral traditions. Jesus plus circumcisions. Jesus plus keeping their customs, their traditions, their laws regulating what is clean and unclean. They were in essence saying that not all Jews are Christians. But all Christians must be Jews. That is in essence what they were saying. Uh, and so they, I mean, we can, we, uh, their, their argument could be very persuasive. Uh, if we read how Paul answers us, and you always need to be careful when doing that, you're sort of trying to read how, what Paul answers at really what the issues were. Uh, but if we, if, we, if we try and do that, we'll see that they, these Jews were saying, listen, we are descendants of Abraham. And, and we know that God gave uh, Abraham a promise that would include a blessing to the Gentiles. And that will come through Abraham. And so in order to inherit this blessing coming through Abraham, you Gentiles need to do what Abraham had to do. That means you, you need to get circumcised. And then, the, and then these descendants of Abraham were given the law, the Mosaic law. And so if, you're, if you Gentiles want to be included into the promises of Abraham, then you need to keep the law. And in particular, it seems like this issue revolves around the laws re regulating what was to be considered clean and unclean. Uh, certainly in regards with, with our passage, Peter, Peter withdrew from the Gentiles when certain men came from, from James. Uh, you see, God gave these laws... <laughs> These laws stipulating what is clean and unclean uh, in regards to food, in regards to behavior, in regards to uh, really conditions or, or actions, uh, what, what renders someone, might render you clean or unclean. God gave them these laws to teach them that He is holy and that nothing unclean is acceptable to Him. Now, the Gentiles who did not have the law and therefore did not live by these stipulations, they were considered to be unclean. They were considered to be unacceptable by God. And so historically, these uh, laws physically differentiated and, and segregated the people of God 
with the Gentiles or from the Gentiles. However, with the coming of Jesus, he removed these barriers through his life and death and, and resurrection, and he rendered all who would come to him by faith as clean and as acceptable. And so Jesus thought at his coming that the time for these laws have passed. We read in Mark chapter 7, verse 14, he says, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of man are what defile the man. And, he, and his disciples was questioning him about that on this matter. And so he continued and he says in verse 18, do, not, do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart but into his stomach? And he's eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things proceed from within and defile the man. And then, of course, later on, after uh, the Spirit of God has been poured out, Jesus was, 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 has ascended to heaven, God showed to Peter the same lesson, that, that the Gentiles are now accepted in Christ through faith. And God showed Peter through, through, through a vision of a sheet coming down out of heaven filled with unclean animals and with the, with the command to kill and eat. And, and Peter objected and says, no, no way, Lord. Uh, I've never eaten anything unholy or unclean. And which God then answered and says, let no man call what he has declared clean and holy to be unclean and holy. And so right at that moment in time when he was still thinking about this vision, there arrived messengers from the Gentile centurion Cornelius um, asking him to come to his house. And, and Peter went to his house and really was saying to him as he arrived there in Acts 10, 28, he says, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit with him. And yet God has showed me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. So what's going on here? And so he then proceeded to, to, to preach the gospel to Cornelius. And, and while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit became on Cornelius and his family, uh, and they were saved. And of course, Paul then, uh, sorry, Peter then stayed with them for about three days, which was really unheard of. And, and later on, when he went back to Jerusalem, some of the Jewish Christians took issue with him on that matter. They criticized him for it. Uh, later on in Acts chapter 15, we read that uh, having to decide this issue of what should we do with the Gentiles, uh, again, Peter argued that they have been declared clean by God, saying in verse 9, God made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. And so it is pretty shocking for us to read, although Galatians is an early letter, uh, and it may have been written even before the the Council of Jerusalem. But here we read of, of, of Peter uh, withdrawing from, from the Gentiles. Uh, all the more reason for us to be on our guard, not to be seduced by this tendency for us as humans, not necessarily even this issue here, but in general, a tendency for us to add to the gospel, and we'll see as we, as we go on. But, but later on, Paul proclaimed really the mystery that has been revealed to him that was previously hidden but now revealed to him. Part of that mystery was that the Gentiles would be included in the plans of, 
of God, that they will be part of his family. They will be now one body made, made up of Jews and Gentiles. And in Ephesians 2 verse 11 we read, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. And so Christ ended the segregation based on the ordinances of the law, what is clean and unclean, uh, if, you are, if you have faith in Christ, you are accepted by God. And so in this letter, Paul addresses this issue. And I'll run quickly through his answer. It's, it's quite a, uh, lengthy and, 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 uh, and, ne and necessary. And it will be good for you to read this for yourselves. But basically he says in chapter 2 verse 16 that makes the claim that no man will be justified by works of law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed that he's... Chapter 2, verse 16, he is answering Peter at this time. He said, Peter, you and I, we have been believed in Christ Jesus, and we have been justified by him, not by us doing the works of law. Then he reminded them that, uh, the, reminded the Galatians that they have received the Spirit, not by the works of law, but by the hearing of faith, by listening to the gospel and accepting it. Chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of law or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You, see, you have been saved. You have the Spirit. Are you now going to go back to the Lord to try and... Grow in your sanctification, grow closer to the Lord, depending on uh, that obedience to that in order to be more loved by the Lord or to secure His acceptance of you. And then he goes on and he points out in, in chapter 3 verse 7 that, that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And that it is those who are of the works of law are under a curse. Chapter 3 verse 10. Chapter 3 verse 11 that the righteous... Uh, those just, justified before God are those who live by faith that Christ redeemed them from the curse of the law in chapter 3 verse 13 that he redeemed them from the law so that they might receive the adoptions of son chapter 4 verse 5 and so he said all of this all of this is theirs Galatians these, these things belong to you by faith in the gospel by faith in the good news of Jesus Christ, not through works of law. In chapter 3, verse 15, he then just explained where the, where the law fits into God's plans and purposes, the intent of the law. And the intent of the law was really to shut up everybody under the law, really to bound people, um, to keep them in custody, so to speak, until faith comes, until Christ comes, until justification by Faith in Jesus Christ comes. And so he says that the law really serves as a tutor, a tutor leading, uh, teaching them the, the basic, the elemental things. He says in chapter 4, verse 3, and these are the rudimentary teachings, the, the basic principles. It's like a tutor when, they, when it starts, or he starts teaching you how to write. You focus on the ABCs. But once you know the ABCs, you, 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 you go on and now you, you are more uh, inclined to look at what is written rather than going to the rudimentary principles or basic teachings. And he says the law served as a tutor teaching us these, these, these elementary things of God. 
or, or, or it actually says of the world. And he says, but when Christ came, when faith came, there is no longer a need for us to be under a tutor. And he says that all who are in Christ have been baptized into him and have clothed themselves with Christ. And therefore, now all Jew and Gentile are one in Christ, accepted. Verse, verse uh, 26 to 29 of, of chapter 3. Jew and Gentile, slave and free man, male and, f- and female, are all one in Christ. We all belong to Christ, and all the promises of Abraham belongs to those who have been adopted and who've been, who've been baptized into Christ, have now been adopted as the sons of God. You've been redeemed, you've been loosed, you've been set free from the, the guardianship and the stewardship is another way in which he describes the law. And so therefore, you don't need circumcision, you don't need the works of law, which serve to separate and the unclean from the, the clean before Christ, before faith came. But now that Christ has come, and you are in Christ through faith, he says, you are clean, you are accepted, you are justified, not by the works of law, but by faith in Christ. And so, in fact, by introducing these things again now, by separating people again in asking them to be circumcised, to follow these laws regarding uh, clean and unclean things, you are actually poisoning the unity of the body. You are actually bringing a partition, dividing the body of, of Christ. You are actually uh, just uh, handing out patches that feed your pride. Say, well, I, at least I'm doing these things and I'm doing that. And that is what the Judaizers were doing. They were, in fact, undoing what Christ came to do. And therefore, Paul was very strong in condemning them. He says, you guys are messing with the gospel, the good news of Christ. So let me just say something about the poison of legalism. You see, uh, we in the church, of course, today, we don't have the same issues as what they had in, in, in Galatia. I mean, we are... I think most of us are Gentiles. I uh, don't think we have any Jewish people among us. But, so we don't, we don't have that, that issue, that, that struggle. Uh, but there are individuals and there are my churches which may emphasize certain beliefs or practices which have to be followed in order to be part of them, in order to be accepted by them. Remember, these, these were, this letter was written to Christians. They've heard the gospel. They believed the gospel. They received the Spirit. But now they have been deceived by this distortion of the gospel. And the Judaizers were saying that you need Jesus plus these works of law to be accepted, to be loved by God, to be included, to be embraced. That is, that is poisonous. And so what does that look like for us today? Well, there are some churches who will insist on faith in Jesus, but then very subtly add other convictions, other practices to the gospel. In order to be accepted, in order to be part of us, these are the things that you need to do as well. And so, we, we, well, it's easy to spot what we would call the legalistic churches. Those who would say, well, if you want to be part of us, you need to have the gospel, you need to have Jesus Christ, plus only King James Bible. Or that you need to have Jesus, plus adhere to certain dress codes. You have to wear a head covering, or you have to wear a tie and a suit to be accepted. Or you need the gospel and only use one big cup for communion. These small glasses, no. Nope. And lo and behold, if you have unleavened bread there, no. Nope. 
And so they, we, we started to add things to the gospel. Add certain beliefs to the gospel that marks ourselves out as, as, as different. Also, this is legalistic churches. They are also liberal churches. What liberal churches would do is, is, for them, the most important thing for you is to just be a loving person, to be a good person. In a sense, they not so much care about what you believe, but as long as you are good and uh, are caring for other people. And so really what they have done in a, in a sweet way is they have advocated good works, benevolent, charitable works, which they believe will make you more acceptable to the Lord, more respected by others. They also may add tolerance, the tolerance of others' views, even sin, that contradicts the gospel. And tolerance is really then the supreme qualification which shows that you are accepted by God and respected by others. Other churches is what I would call the, the let God and let go churches. They emphasize that you need Jesus. You need to surrender yourself, your life to Jesus. And whatever that may mean for them. But the emphasis is not on Christ. The emphasis is on the strength of your faith. It is how committed you are. It is how devoted you are. It's less about the object of our faith and more the subject, which is us. So how much faith can you conjure up? How much faith can you muster And if you, uh, if you are willing to give it all up and forsake all, everything, regardless of the consequences, then, then you are accepted among us. Now, I have to say that all of these things that I've mentioned can be good and right to do if you do it with the right motive. It is when you still are seeking to somehow find greater blessing from God, greater favor from Him, be more acceptable of Him, or you are trying to impress others with it, that's when you are tampering with the gospel that you believe. And so really the truth is that in all three of these examples, there is a standard of righteousness that is humanly quantifiable. A standard of righteousness that is measurable and therefore comparable. And so in each of these examples, whether it be religious belief, uh, righteous deeds, righteous actions or attitudes, they are treated as a commodity, something to trade with. And so if I have a lot of this, then I can trade that with God so that he would bless me more. He would love me more. Or I can gain status and standing before others because I have this practical righteousness. And so really we, we need to rethink our understanding of, of Christian legalism. You see, the Christian legalists will never say that they are justified by works. I mean, we, we simply won't say that. We, we, they, we would affirm that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. We would memorize Ephesians 2.8. Uh, it's, not, it's, not of, it's not of us. But then very subtly slip in certain things. These acts of righteousness, these attitudes, these beliefs which we do to accumulate this wealth of righteousness, so to speak, this commodity. And we believe that it will give us greater favor with God. It will bring us greater blessing from God. It will make God love us more. Or it will give us a greater status, standing and respect before other people. If I do these things, then I will be seen to be upright. Then I will be seen to be godly, to be holy. 
Then they will recognize me for the next ministry position. Then they will recognize me as potential and elder. When we do that, we are trading in righteousness. When we believe that, we are believing a distortion of the gospel. When our Christian identity, our acceptance by God, His love for us, and our righteous standing before Him are being evaluated no longer by the merits of Christ alone, but by what He has done and now what we are doing. And so what happens is we, we take our eyes off Jesus. We no longer do these things because we love Him and because He has saved us, but we do it to earn something, to gain something. Our devotion becomes selfish. Our devotion becomes self-centered instead of Christ-like and Christ-focused. And when we act and think this way, then the gospel by which we live have been distorted. And when we advocate that, then we start dividing the church into the haves and the have-nots. Those who have a large quantity of righteousness that everybody can see and those who are, have not. And that is, it's very dangerous and it's very subtle. And it's very seductive. Peter fell for it. Barnabas fell for it. It would seem that the Apostle James fell for it. And so, bringing us to our passage this morning, chapter 2, verse 11, we see that Peter was really posturing himself before these people, before these men from James, these Jewish Christians. Peter changed his social habits, his, his eating habits, so to speak. Verse 11, we see, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to coming to, of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined, in, joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. You see, Peter's sin was really not that he ate with Gentiles. That is not a sin. It's not that he, he was fraternizing with the unclean, so to speak. His sin was that he withdrew from them. His sin was that he was afraid. He had a fear of men. His sin was hypocrisy. His sin was posturing before these men. Peter knew that he was justified by faith in Christ and not by works of law. His justification was never in doubt in his mind or in Paul's mind for that matter. But however, he was afraid they would question his sanctification. He was afraid that these prominent men of James these Judaizers, would think less of his righteousness, that he is actually unrighteous, that he is unworthy, that he is unfit, that he is unclean to hold the position that he has. Mommy. Not because he sinned against God, but because he sinned against the Judaizers, what they have added to the gospel. He failed to adhere to their added requirements to the gospel. And he was afraid they would question him and then question his righteousness. His reputation was at stake. And so Peter's sin was posturing. He was acting in a way in which he himself did not believe. In verse 14, Paul said that he was not straightforward with the truth. Really, he was not walking straightly. He was, he was out of line. He was out of step with the truth of the gospel. Why? Because he was afraid. And so what about us today? Where does it, where, how do we see this 
in our day? Well, we don't really struggle with circumcision and, and things like that, but sectarianism is rife and present in the church. I mean, every church, and it's almost inevitable that each church would have their unique distinctions and peculiar beliefs and practices that are not directly tied to the gospel, the core gospel beliefs. And so these have to do with your, your specific convictions about peripheral doctrines, uh, social behaviors, uh, church policy, administration, practices. But when we start to emphasize these things, these dis distinctions, and we exalt our practices to show ourselves that we are better than others, that our church is superior to other churches, that our church is the best church, and we start excluding others and looking down on others, then I think we are drifting towards another gospel. There may be social differences. Another way of distorting the gospel is to treat others that are different to us as unclean in the sense that we don't mix, we don't really engage, we are not welcoming. And so whether that will be socioeconomic differences, um, blue-collar workers with white-collar workers, it's just, just the rich, the poor. It could be ethnic or cultural differences. It could be educational differences. It could be political differences. And nowadays, vaccination status differences. And all of a sudden, you need Christ plus to be accepted. Christ plus to be included. You need to be like us. And so, I mean, we will be kind to them. We will, we will, we will interact with them uh, that are different from us at church. We will, we will sit next to, to them and we may even share a cup of tea with them. But we won't fellowship with them. We won't show hospitality to them. We won't seek to get to know them better. We won't become friends with them. Why? Because they are unclean to us. They are not like us. They are different. And people, we are all unclean before Christ. But in Christ, He has made us clean. He has made us holy. He has made us acceptable and worthy of His love and our love. In spite of our differences, in spite of our, the social awkwardness that may be there, apart from the social status or the, the standing or status in life. And so sectarianism, social differences, there may even be special preferences that we exalt. This, these are really cultural uh, preferences that we uh, give moral, moral significance to. And of course, my mind immediately go to style of worship. That one style of worship is holier than another. That if we sing only hymns with hardly any instrumentation, that is somehow holier than someone who has a far more lively uh, worship expression. Or that the ambience of the place we meet in, or the lack of ambience, somehow affords us to be more superior than the others. It, it shows a, a greater love or a deeper devotion to the Lord. Or perhaps it's the type of coffee we serve. Do we have a barista? Or not? Well, I mean, that's silly that, but... but you, you understand what I'm trying to say. There, there are a lot of things that we can add to 
the gospel which then keeps others at arm's length because they are not like us. And we need to remember that we are all far more wicked, far more evil, far more deceitful in heart than we can ever imagine. But in Christ, in Christ, we are more loved, we are more accepted, we are more precious and cherished than we can ever hope to dare or dream of. And so we should repent of our posturing And we should embrace, really, the privilege of Paul, the privilege that Paul expressed here to Peter in these verses. Uh, in chapter 14 to 21 of Galatians 2, Paul really called out Peter. But it is how he ends that is really the highlight and that shows the importance of the pure gospel. Because it is only if the gospel is pure, if the gospel is uncontaminated, that it will set us free from the tyranny of seeking to save ourselves, seeking to make us more acceptable, seeking to get God to love us more and bless us more. It is only the true gospel that will set us free to live for Him. And so Paul called him out. And when I saw that it was not, it was, they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, you who are being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. How is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among Gentiles. He is saying to, to Peter, listen, we, we, are, we, we grew up with this. We have the law. And so we, we, we know what is clean and unclean. Uh, they are sinners because they never had the law. They don't know what is clean and unclean. And then verse 16, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of law, since the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And so he just reiterated to Peter, Peter, what are you doing? You know that you cannot be more righteous before God by doing this. It's by faith that we are righteous. It's by faith that we are accepted. It's by faith that we are clean. It's by faith that we are justified before God. And then verse 17 to 18, it's hard to, 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 to understand exactly what Paul was, was communicating here and, and whether these words were directed to, to Peter or, or some other accusation. Uh, but I understand it to be, to be an accusation that, that, that Paul was answering. And the accusation is that, listen, by not looking to the law for your justification, it actually promotes lawless living. Sinful living, unclean living, and therefore it makes Jesus actually a servant of sin. That was the accusation. And Paul says, may that never be. That cannot be. That will never be. And he goes on and says, because if I rebuild now what I've destroyed, I only prove myself to be a transgressor. If I, who destroyed the barrier, this, the barrier, the, the law which separates Jew and Gentiles, uh, with the gospel message of justification um, through faith in Christ alone, and then go afterwards and reinstate the law in place of Christ as a means to be justified, as a means to be sanctified, as a means to be righteous and clean, then the, that very law will only prove that I'm a law breaker in the first place. And actually show that, I was, um, that I'm not justified is Paul's counter-argument. And then verse 19 and 20, and people, this is, this is what makes want me to shout like William Wallace, freedom! Because if we understand this, you will know that the gospel, this pure, simple, unadulterated, undiluted gospel is what will set you free to live 
for Christ. To set you free from living under the tyranny of trying to make yourself acceptable, trying to please God when you are already acceptable, when He is already pleased with you more than you can ever be because you are in Christ. And so Paul says that through the law I die to the law so that I may live to God. He said, Paul said, because through faith in Christ I am in union with Christ, he therefore died to the law as a means to be justified so that he may be free not, not to sin but to live for God. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see, the law demands the death of those who break it. And Christ died for that. He paid that penalty. And Paul and all of us who are in Christ through faith are in union with Christ. We died with Him when He died to the law. So the law has no longer any claim on us. It no longer condemns us. It is paid. Our penalty has been paid. We are released from the law as a means to be right to God. I don't have to now worry about that because I am in Christ. And so I can stop focusing on doing works of law in order to be right with God and start living as one who is right with God. I have freedom. And so if we feel condemned, if we fear that God may have rejected us because we failed Him, because we sinned against Him, if we fear that God does not love us anymore or care for us anymore because of what we have done, a sin that we have committed, a failing in... It is because we have forgotten that we are dead to the law. It's because we have forgotten that we are not saved, we are not justified by our obedience to the law. We are free from the Lord. The law cannot condemn us anymore. It cannot harm us any longer. And because we are dead to the law in Christ, we are free to live for God. You see, Paul was, was an incredible zealous man before Christ. <laughs> And Paul was seeking to be right with God by keeping the law, by doing the works of the Lord, by doing good deeds. But Paul was never really living for God. For in keeping the law, for in living righteously, for in living morally, he was not really doing it for God. He was doing it for himself. It was an attempt to be justified through these works. He did it for his own reward, for his own benefit. It was done for Paul and not for God. And so when we believe that we have been justified by faith in Christ, we are free to live for Him. We don't have to satisfy the tyranny of demands of the law in order to be satisfied, to be accepted, to be loved, to be blessed. We have all of that in Christ. But if we add requirements, if we add demands, if we add conditions to the law, by our own design, our own whatever it may be, 
we bring ourselves in bondage again. We need to do these things now to be right with God, to maintain our relationship with God. And that is a poison. That is a distorted gospel. It is subtle and it's slow acting, but it's deadly. It will kill your joy. It will kill your peace. It will kill your freedom to live for God. So maybe, maybe I, I can explain this to you like this. Uh, perhaps you've experienced a, a really bad day. <laughs> Everything just went wrong. I mean, you name it, it didn't go well. And you may have a few of those days. And then you discover that, you know what, every time I have a bad day is because I did not spend time in the morning with the Lord. My devotions, I didn't, didn't get to that morning. And so I had a bad day. And so now, I am very disciplined. Very disciplined to get up in the morning and to spend time with the Lord. It is critical to me. And that is true, people. We need to spend time with the Lord. We need to start the day with the Lord. But if you link that to hope, to earn, that God will give you an easy day, that God will give you a good day, that God will bless me in this day, at that moment, you are doing it for yourself, not because you love Him. It's very subtle. And again, as I said, please hear me right. Spend time with the Lord. Get up in the morning and worship Christ. But do it because you are free to do it. Not because you hope you may get some blessing or favor or be more loved by Him. Because then you're doing it for yourself. And not for Him. And that is, this is what Paul is saying here. He says, I'm crucified. I've been crucified with Christ. Me, I, don't know, no, I, I no longer live. Anything good, anything righteous that I may have done, actually it's not me. It's not because of me. Why? Because I don't live for me anymore. I don't do these things for me anymore. I do them for the one who died, who gave himself up for me. Who loved me. That's why I do these things. And that is a powerful and pure motivation. That is to be set free from the tyranny in order, a tyranny of pleasing the Lord through some kind of deeds in order to experience his blessing. When we have his blessing, when we have his love, when we have his acceptance. And it all starts and ends with the gospel, with the purity of the gospel, with the true gospel, with the unadulterated gospel, undistorted gospel. And so, like Paul, I, I want us to go away today and, 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 and remember the good news, the message of the gospel. And realize, yes, we are bad. We are evil. Our hearts are more deceitful than anything else. Above all else, says Jeremiah. But, but, in Christ, in Christ, we are more loved, more accepted, more precious and cherished by God than we can ever hope or dare to dream. And that is what sets us free to live for the Lord and not to still try and live our Christian life for ourselves. That is freedom! As well, what's, what's his name? William Wallace would have said. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that you have set us free 
from the tyranny of trying to please you through works of righteousness, of good deeds, of abstaining from things, of adding things, of whatever it may be, Lord, so that we may live freely for you and for your name and for your glory. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.